would you prefer to speak from Hi, welcome from all, from and uh, thank you all for coming to you. our, I think our third or fourth event, Rob, in our globalization series. Uh, this new initiative that Rob is heading up for NDN uh, is really trying to take a fresh look at globalization, really one of the defining issues of our time, and trying to help uh, the country create a, a better narrative, a better story, a better set of arguments about what is happening in globalization that's really more relevant to what's happening today than perhaps what was happening in the 1990s. I want to applaud Rob for his remarkable work that he's done. For people who come from his background, he speaks plain English, uh, I think, very effectively uh, and has really been a great communicator to those of us uh, in, in, uh, in the political world to how to navigate these very difficult and complicated issues. And I just want to say two quick things about, about this relevant to some of the battles that are in front of us today is that I really do believe, and in, in the spirit of this project, is trying to tackle problems. And what NDN has always been about has been a problem-solving entity that's willing to work with people on both sides to tackle important challenges facing the country and throughout our history. And on this, on this issue of globalization, I think it fits into the context of a broader set of disappointments, I think, that we have that the majority party and the political leadership of the country are not just making mistakes, and we could talk about Iraq and so on, that mistakes have been made, but it's really the set of challenges that are not being addressed that in many ways the presidential campaign in 07 and 08 is really going to be focused on. And you can make your own list, whether it's global climate change or health care or the rise of autocracies in China and in, and in uh, Russia. I mean, whatever your set of issues are that you wish the American political system was addressing, immigration is something we're working on right now, passionately really trying to work with McCain Kennedy to pass a, a good bill to solve the problem. This issue of what's happening with the American middle class and American workers in this age of globalization, this century, really is one of the central challenges that we face. And, and there really isn't a serious conversation happening about it in Washington today. And I think this has really been one of the, the Republican parties and Bush administration's greatest failures of leadership. What we've had is unprecedented economic circumstances. We've had a robust recovery in some measures. We've had GDP is up, productivity is up. You've had uh, corporate profits are doing well. Capital and corporations are navigating this new global economy fairly effectively in the United States. It's just the people who are not doing as well. We've had declining income for five consecutive, declining wages for five consecutive years. Healthcare costs have doubled. The number of uninsured have increased. Energy costs have increased. Now rising interest rates are putting greater squeezes on the, on the debtor class in the United States. We don't have a national strategy right now that's going to ensure broad-based prosperity in a way that is consistent with America's core values and who we are as a country. And our hope through this project, with Rob's leadership and through working with all of you, is that by 07 and 08, that both parties will be addressing this issue. What is our strategy in the 21st century to create broad-based prosperity to ensure that we have rising incomes and that, the, and that the tide is really lifting all boats, not just the boats of the privileged few. And so with us today, as part of this ongoing conversation, we have, I think, one of the most thoughtful people literally in the whole world uh, about these challenges that we face, Andy Stern, who has been a, a great friend of ours and somebody who I've watched and admired uh, incredibly from afar and in, recently in, in recent years been able to get to know much better. And, uh, you know, he and I talked recently about the fact that He's getting all this press attention because he's talking about workers and what's happening with workers in the United States, in a part because nobody else is. I mean, the political system really isn't addressing some of the things that he's raising. I, I wish it wasn't such news, uh, but it is. And, and, but we all have to admire his unbelievably spirited, determined leadership in really fighting for the, wor the working people in the United States in a way that very few other people are in this country. So I'm very proud that he's part of this series. Um, we're doing a lot of work with SEIU. They've really emerged as critical leaders, I think, in the entire progressive movement, and uh, we're happy to have them with us today. And Rob, uh, and I just want to say one thing about Rob. For those of you who don't know Rob, Rob was the Clinton uh, chief economic advisor to Bill Clinton in the 1992 campaign, the Undersecretary of Commerce, somebody who I've worked with closely over many years. And last year we wrote a series of essays about globalization where we sort of started to see intellectually if we were in the same place, and we felt we were. And then recently we hatched this, uh, what would be a multi-year project. It's probably my Blackberry, I apologize. Um, I know, turn off all the Blackberries, please. Um, the, uh, t this multi-year project around globalization that we hope will really make a difference. So thank you all for being here. Rob, take it away. Thanks, Simon. Um, 
I really do think that this project is very important uh, for Democrats and very important for the country because we haven't really come to full grips with either the nature of globalization or how to talk about it to the American people. And th this project is a conversation not only with leaders, uh, thought leaders like Andy, but also with all of you uh, to try to figure this out. Um, two leading papers in America have called Andy a uh, charismatic leader, one out to create a new and more dynamic labor movement. I, I think he'll need all the insight and talents evident in that kind of reputation to figure out how to address some of the dynamics that are developing today. Something quite unique has been happening in the U.S. economy. For as long as anyone has kept records on these things, there has been a pretty stable relationship between how fast the economy grows and how many jobs it creates, between how much productivity increases and how much wages go up. That's what market economies are supposed to do. Um, growth, demand, creates employment. Productivity in labor markets creates competition and wages go up. Um, those fundamental relationships uh, have broken down significantly in the last five years. Um, in the 2001 recession, the shortest and briefest, uh, the briefest and mildest in 50 years, um, the number of jobs lost relative to the decline in GDP was six times what it had been in the average of previous recessions. From 2001 to 2004, in, th in those three years, we lost 2.7 million manufacturing jobs. From 1979 to 1992, the period of, quote unquote, the deindustrialization of America, those 13 years, we lost 2.3 million manufacturing jobs. We lost more manufacturing jobs in the period of globe when, as globalization has accelerated, than we did in that entire period. Something clearly different has been happening. Even today, four years into what looks to be, by most, certainly by GDP measures, a very strong recovery, uh, job creation is running at about 50% of the rate that it was running in a comparable point in the previous expansion. Why is unemployment so low if we're not creating jobs? Because the labor participation rate has fallen three percentage points, which is also virtually unheard of. Um, so there's something very different happening in the U.S. economy today. And the other side of that is wages. Um, we've had, we have had stronger productivity growth in the last four years than we had in the heyday of the Clinton years, which was something that we were very proud of. Um, in the Clinton administration. Productivity gains have averaged 3.3% a year. Um, the difference is that uh, four years of very strong productivity gains have been accompanied by four years of declining real wages, even declining median income. Um, this, again, is not supposed to happen in a market economy and didn't happen in the 1990s when we had about 2.5% annual productivity gains. Real wages were going up. That's also true, incidentally, for real compensation. That is, even if you take account of <coughs> health care costs. Um, uh, so now let's try to drill down a little into this, what's happening to wages, and try to figure it out a little more. And I, you know, I always begin thinking about this by what everybody thinks about China, China's wages. Average manufacturer workers in America get paid about $21 per hour. That compares to $2.30 in Mexico and about $0.70 cents in China. Um, now, they're not equally productive. Um, our $21 an hour workers are more productive than the $2.30 per hour workers in Mexico or the $0.70 cent per hour workers in, in China. But in addition, that $21 an hour ranges from some workers making $60 an hour, very highly productive manufacturing workers, to others making $10 or $11 an hour. And the same thing is true in, in Mexico. Um, in Mexico, there's some making $6 an hour and others making a buck an hour. Um, what's happening by and large 
is that China is picking off some of the low and high cost workers in Mexico, not in the United States. The China is not picking off uh, manufacturing workers in the United States. They're competing with Mexico, with other low wage, relatively low wage um, workers. And Mexico is picking off some of the low cost workers here. That is not the ones earning $60 an hour, but the ones earning $10 an hour. Um, the direct effect of compensation levels in China, or in the Philippines, or Honduras, or El Salvador, which incidentally put a lot of competitive pressure on Mexico too, um, they threaten Mexico along with Portugal, and Poland, and Chile, and Malaysia, much more than the United States. But there's secondary effects. When Mexico and Poland lose jobs to China and Honduras, their manufacturers have only one choice. What do Mexican and Polish manufacturers do? They have to upgrade themselves because they can't compete with lower wage manufacturers in Honduras and China. Um, so they can do things that Chinese and Honduran workers and companies can't do. So they move up the value chain. And as they do, they put competitive pressures on countries that are a little more developed than they are. Taiwan, for example, or Turkey, or South Korea. And the same process happens in Taiwan, South Korea, and Turkey. They come under competitive pressure from Poland and Portugal and Mexico, and their manufacturers move up the value chain a little. Um, and now they're putting more competitive pressure on Germany and the United States. So the entry of China in as a huge global producer sets off a chain of events of shifts in investment, labor, and capital that end up intensifying competition in sectors that have nothing to do with what China is actually producing. Um, again, China is not costing the United States very many jobs directly, but China's role in the global economy driving other countries to upgrade their own businesses and workforces costs U.S. jobs both directly and indirectly. Um, directly as, as our near competitors take some of our markets and indirectly by intensifying competition. And this is, I think, the key to understanding, to trying to figure out what's happening to wages and jobs in America. And that is, as competition intensifies, businesses lose what economists like me call pricing leverage. That means that, when, that it's harder for them to raise their prices because competition is more intense. What happens when your costs go up and you can't raise your prices? What happens when health care costs go up 50 percent and energy costs go up 50 percent because the United States has no health care policy and has no energy policy and businesses are constrained in their ability to raise their prices? They cut other things. They cut jobs and they cut wages. And that's what's been happening to the American economy. That's why productivity can rise and wages don't. Why we can grow at a very fast rate and create jobs at half the rate that we used to. Um, and on top of that, and then I'm going to turn to Andy, is the role of technology, which is magnifying some of these effects, particularly on workers in the middle. Um, we've looked at job creation over the last 15 years. Jobs grew fairly strong rate at the bottom, bottom 20 percent, and top 20 percent. In the center, they grew very slowly even in the 90s, and in this era have in fact been contracting. Um, what's happening there is um, Economists have looked at the kinds of jobs those are, and what they predominantly are are what are called routine mental work. That is, it's not physical labor, which is at the bottom, and it's not unique mental work, where you're solving a different problem every day, um, which is the problem of managers and professionals. It's people like accountants and secretaries and operators who do re routine mental tasks, which can then be replaced by technology. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this is the precise, a, a very uh, similar phenomenon to what we are facing with outsourcing of service jobs, routine of mentally, of routine mental jo uh, uh, or cerebral jobs to English-speaking low-wage countries. 
So this is also a, uh, a kind of the next stage of the job and wage problem um, that globalization is presenting. Um, so I think these are some of the challenges we face, and the challenge is that Andy Stern, who has built the largest and fastest growing union in America, um, is trying to meet. Um, Andy. So let me say thanks to Robin. It's always nice to come to a place where, um, since I know nothing about economics, but to hear someone say nothing's working like we thought it was economically. Uh, and I think we all need to appreciate no one really has an answer here. And we should be very thoughtful about trying to think about the future by not what I think Rob just did, underestimating you know, what is happening around the world in China and Indian places, not today, but what the potential is five and ten years from now. Because I think we do a very good job explaining what's happening today and not a very good job thinking about what's happening tomorrow, which uh, better than the Democratic Party who thinks about what was happening yesterday most of the time. So at least we're making progress um, all around here. And, and let me just say thank you to Simon and to Rob. You know, I've said to Simon years ago, you know, there's a desperate need for a conversation in our country about its future because we are at a very different moment of economic history than any of us have ever experienced, and I'll talk about that. Uh, two, amongst Democrats, this is like a third rail. We can't talk about trade, we can't talk about the economy, because somehow you know, it's going to blow our party up. And I think, in fact, what hurts Democrats is the fact we can't have a vision of the future because we're trapped in all of our different positions. And I'd say Simon and NDN has done more than anyone else to try to at least promote the conversation, the dialogue. So you could talk about all of this in sort of the, the micro and the macro, which I'll do both. I like to say you could talk about people or policy. So let me start talking about people. Uh, I just, as many of you know, and Harold Myerson wrote about it in the Washington Post, we just ended a, a very contentious situation uh, at the University of Miami. I was down there on Martin Luther King's birthday, and I met the workers uh, who were involved there. The president of the university is Donna Shalala, which kind of adds an irony to the whole situation. And the issue really was these workers had been working for five to ten years, and at the time were making $6.50 an hour, and with no health care benefits. And when I asked them, had they gotten a raise recently, their, their faces lit up, which I thought was a smile, but really was their own sense of irony, because they said, yeah, I got a raise last year of seven cents an hour, and I got a raise this year of four cents an hour. And these women and men, you know, make the beds, clean the toilets, uh, empty the waste baskets in the offices, the dorms, Donna Shalala's 9,000 square foot house, um, every single day. And that's their life. Uh, I then flew to Minnesota. I thought, well, you know, Miami happens to be, it's hard to imagine this, but the third poorest city in America. Because you never think of Miami as a third poorest city after Detroit and El Paso. So I just think we all should appreciate sometimes we miss when we're walking along all those nouveau restaurants and we see those gleaming towers. There's a whole other America out there. In fact, if you ever go to Miami, they're actually over town and, and the kind of poor Haitian communities are being pushed out as, as development goes. And now we have a problem that they're being squeezed between the Everglades, you know, and now people want to develop the Everglades to move the slums, you know, further away from the city because the property values are going so high. But Miami is the third poorest city. So I go to Minnesota at a very successful hospital chain where the CEO makes $800,000. The chain made $66 million in profits for a nonprofit last year, which is all perfectly fine. Uh, and I met with Grabe, the worker who's uh, in the housekeeping department. Grabe was explaining to me what the discussion is at his dinner table. Uh, it's this, uh, the hospital pays health care uh, for, for himself. For his family, he has to pay a certain amount of money. And the first price for family coverage covers two children. Grabe has four children. So he doesn't have enough to cover the other two. So he and his wife are debating which of their children are less likely to get sick so they can decide which one they're going to cover for health care. And then I went to the port of Long Beach. If anybody's ever seen the ports in California, they are just booming. You know, there are, the containers are piled up. They almost look like matchsticks. There's just so many of them out there. And I met the truck drivers. And for all of us who grew up in my era, you know, being a Teamster truck driver was just an incredibly good job that raised lots of American people up. You know, all these drivers are now independent contractors. Uh, when they get done paying for their rigs and their insurance or whatever, they, they make 8 to $9 an hour, far less than truck drivers made 
30 years ago. And as some people would say, all of these jobs have nothing to do with China, have nothing to do with India. The distribution problem is not because they can't raise the price of the product. It's because the distribution of wealth is just in the wrong way in America, not because the truck drivers are you know, competing with truck drivers uh, overseas. They're actually in the place where we should be creating good jobs in the ports because of trade. These should be the places where Americans are doing well uh, dealing with the change in the economy. So that's the, the micro. Here's the macro. This country is a gift. It is an incredible gift. You know, for generations, our parents, our grandparents have come to its shores. People have worked really hard, and they've had their work valued and rewarded. And more importantly, every generation, despite a civil war, two world wars, natural disasters, recessions and depressions, every generation of kids have done better than their parents. And this may be the first one that doesn't. So I've spent my whole life trying to work to make America the place where hard work is valued and rewarded. And all of us together may have as our legacy that our kids do worse than their parents. That's not the America I want. That's not the America I love. That's not the America we need. And that's the America we face. 52% of all Americans think their kids will do worse than their parents. Only 18% think they'll do better. So that's the America I'm trying to preserve. You would think our political parties would want to preserve because hard work is the most fundamental value other than national security that we have, have come to love about our country, and it's not working anymore. So what's happening? One, this is not, as, as Rob said, our father's or grandfather's economy. The amount of goods that are produced in a single day today are equal to... Uh, the amount of goods that were produced in a year when I was born. So one day we're producing the amount of goods of 1940. The amount of phone calls made today are equal to all the phone calls made in 1983. For any of you who have kids and know what a Furby is, Furby has four times the computing power at the, the Apollo spaceship that landed on the moon. This is just not our fathers. It is fun, as Rob said, it is fundamentally different. And the Tofflers, I think, if you ever read Alvin and Heidi Toffler's book, it actually has Newt Gingrich, interestingly enough, as the, in the foreword of it. You know, they, I think, 10 years ago got it exactly right, you know, that we are living through the most profound, the most transformative economic re revolution in the history of the world. And we should just come to grips with this. The agricultural revolution took 3,000 years. The industrial revolution took 300 years. Our revolution that we're living through, you can call it the knowledge, the mind work, the service, is going to take 30 years. No generation has ever seen an entire new economy created in front of their eyes. And as the Toffler say, we're building a new civilization, a worldwide civilization in one generation. So this is a profound moment. And in some ways, should have profound opportunities. We shouldn't be, it's scary because it's very different. And the old ways aren't working, as Rob said. The, the, the paradigms are shifting everywhere uh, under our feet, and people are trying to write about them and understand them, which is totally appropriate. The question is what we're going to do about them. And tra there's nothing more important than globalization. You know, the 100 largest economies in the world, 51 are corporations. You know, Walmart's, uh, Walmart's gross sales are equal or greater than the GDP of Venezuela, Singapore, and Ireland. I mean, we, are, we built a global economy. The world is flat. Thomas Friedman is right. We have a second trend that people sort of don't want to talk about because it's, it's somewhat unseemly in political circles, which we live in a world where companies, not countries, are making the rules. See, we collated global trade, global finance, global companies. We, we forgot to create global government. So we have countries, these huge mega corporations creating the rules. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just we need to appreciate it. That's what the pressure is on France. That's what the pressure is on the United States, that we have a worldwide flat production system. Uh, and it's putting enormous pressure on people because when I grew up, it used to be that the pressure was if the North didn't you know, have less unions and less regulation, we were going to move to the South. That was the first. Then if they didn't, after that, we had NAFTA, let's move to south of the border. And as Rob said, now let's move to the South China Sea. We have a flat earth in terms of production. That's going to create all kinds of changes. And we have companies, not countries, making the rules. That's a problem, because how do we regulate this economy when governments can't necessarily control what happens within their own borders, because people have all kinds of production opportunities. And I just say China is much more for real 
than Rob says. China last year, America last year had a record number of entrants into the Intel Science Fair, 65,000. China had 6 million. India graduated more kids from college last year than we did. When China was first opened up its market economy, uh, the management of most Chinese foreign-owned enterprises were foreign nationals. They did not have the capability to run their own businesses, and foreign nationals came in. Today, 70% of those corporations are run by Chinese. This is a very smart society, and they learn. And whatever they're doing now about, you know, well, maybe it's just menial mind work, you know, go out to Berkeley in California, you know, people in those schools from Asian countries are incredibly capable people. 90% of all the scientists in the world by 2010 will be from Asia, the Asian region. I mean, this is a phenomenal moment of history, so we should just not uh, think about this in small terms. And the last thing I'd say about not being our father's and grandfather's economy for all the people like myself who grew up, you know, in, with the New Deal a halo, today we are as far from the New Deal as the New Deal was from the Civil War. Now, I don't think Franklin Roosevelt looked at Abraham Lincoln's economy for the answers to his problems, and I don't know why Democrats kind of keep thinking the New Deal is the answer to our There's a lot of principles of the New Deal. There have been principles of our country that should be enduring. But boy, that was a long time ago when you think about the parallelism between now and the New Deal and the New Deal and the Civil War. So we're in a very different moment. It's not our grandfather's and father's economy. And then there's a whole series of trends in the U.S. Rob talked about you know, the most apparent one. You know, wages was hinged with productivity, profits, and growth. They were just hinged together. It was, you know, John F. Kennedy said a rising tide raises all boats, and John Sweeney appropriately said a rising tide raises the luxury liners. You know, and that's what's happening. It's, this economy is raising the luxury liners and not all boats. It's become unhinged. Why, how, it really doesn't matter it's become unhinged. Productivity is way up. You know, CEO salaries are way up. Uh, you know, and wages are flat or going down. And you know, last year, just you know, if you want to put this in human terms, last year more women went bankrupt than graduated college. There are by next year there will be more women, more kids living in households of parents who have gone bankrupt than households of parents that are divorced. This is our America. There's something really fundamentally different that we have to do. And what we have to do is what Rob and, and Simon are trying to do, is we have to think differently about our country. We really are in Team USA right now. The market is not going to work. I mean, that's what all the free marketeers don't want to say. All the things that are going on are telling you the market is not going to work on its own. We've unhinged the market. Uh, the market isn't raising wages and benefits. We have to intervene somehow as a nation and make some very hard choices if Team USA is going to be successful in a global economy. And look at Ireland. I mean, I remember when Ireland's greatest export product was people. They're exporting people all over the world. And hard as it is for Americans to believe, you know, business and labor and government came together and they actually made some kind of social compact. You know, they didn't have a communist five-year plan. They didn't have some big government bureaucracy. They sort of made a social compact about where they were going to invest, what they were going to do. And Ireland's now the second most successful economy in Europe. If America doesn't have a plan in this new, very different economy, we are going to fail. So what do we do? First thing is we should do something about our health care system. And where are the courageous business leaders of the 21st century? I mean, this health care system, uh, employer-based health care system is dead. It's over. It's gone. We cannot compete in a global economy putting the cost of health care on the price of products where price of products do, do matter. It just makes no sense. Employers are sick of this employer-based health care system. They're tired of their HR guys coming and telling them, I got a new idea of how we're going to control our health care costs this year. You know, now it's all the way up to the CEO level because it is so fundamentally a problem, particularly in any industry that has legacy costs. And so we're either going to do one of two things. We are going to end the employer-based health care system by shifting the risk onto people. And we are going to morph into a catastrophic health care system in front of our very eyes. Someone should go back and look at what we were complaining about with seniors at one time. We had that catastrophic plan. And look at what your health care plan is, looks like and where it's going with co-pays and deductibles. We're going to catastrophic health care. We're just not having an American debate about how we get there. We just raise the co-pays and raise the deductibles a little at a time. So we need to end the employer-based health care system. It is not going to work for America in the long run. 
It doesn't mean every time you say that we have, don't have to import the Canadian system to the U.S. We can have a multi-payer system. There are three million workers, many of them here, who work for the federal government, who have FEPHB, you know, where you make all kinds of choices of private plans. You could make it more efficient or less efficient. You could actually bargain with the pharmaceutical companies, God forbid, and, and have, you know, free enterprise really work uh, and let people, you know, aggregate their ability to deal, you know, with reducing prices by aggregating purchasing. But there are lots of things you could do. You, there, you could take a trip to Massachusetts or Vermont. You can go travel around the world. Every country can figure out this problem, and it's time for America to figure out because people are dying, literally dying, uh, because we haven't, and America's economy is threatened. You know, second thing, I think we all know, if we don't want to admit it, the defined benefit pension plan as we know them are ending. 18% of the private sector workers have them, 90% in the public sector. The public sector, there's possible to preserve them because it's just a political question, not an economic uh, question. But, you know, you're watching them end. The real question isn't whether you're going to have an employer-based pension plan. The question is, are you going to have a guaranteed pension? Now, if you happen to be a professor and are part of TIACREF, you know, you can work in lots of different employers pay into a, an account, and at the end of your life, buy an annuity and get a guaranteed pension. Americans really aren't used to dealing with annuities, but they're just guaranteed taking them out of cash and you know, deciding whether you want to play Russian roulette with your cash or you want to buy a policy to get a defined benefit. Americans need defined benefits. We, this 401k thing is just not working. I mean, we have negative saving rates. The average American has 121.2% of their income in debt. Uh, the biggest problem in the healthcare industry when I talk to the CEOs of the hospitals are not the uninsured. They've already compensated for that. What they're finding is the people that have between five and fifteen thousand dollars worth of debt can't pay it with the copays and deductibles. You know, when you have 121 percent of your income in debt, you know, or the average American has ten or eleven thousand dollars, whatever that turns out to, um, you know, adding five or six thousand dollars on it, it means your credit card you can't put it on the credit card anymore. We've already taken $484 billion out of home equity, so everybody owns their home, except we probably just own the walls and the, and the studs right now because the rest of it's owned in home equity loans by someone else. And so we need to figure out a pension plan that allows, in, a, in an economy where people are going to go from job to job to job to job, to not have to go from 401k to 401k to 401k and then try to figure out how to put them all together. Australia's figured out they have a superannuation fund. Everybody pays into these intermediate organizations. TIACREF has a model of how we provide pensions. The Army has a way of how we... Why, why? It's not like these ideas are you know, mystical. It's just we have to have an American decision-making process that gets us uh, to that end. And finally, when it comes to wages, if the market doesn't work, which no one wants to say out loud, Rob got as close to it as the market is not working, all the old ways of growth, productivity, not being hinged with wages. It is unhinged. Someone has to intervene to hinge them. And used to be two people, two entities intervened. One was the government, earned income tax credit, minimum wages, living wages. They intervened, right, to redistribute wealth in the economy, progressive tax systems. Now what we've seen is the government's intervening, but they're redistributing up, you know because all the redistribution policies are up to the rich. But that is one mechanism to redistribute wealth. And the other was this horrible thing that no one likes to talk about called unions, which actually didn't cost the government a dime. For all the people that hate big government bureaucracy, I keep saying to the Republicans, you should be with me. You know, we don't need government programs. We need more disaggregated, wage-setting, sectoral dis ways to set wages in America. They're called unions. And they have to be modern unions and different unions. They also can't be unions like we once were who are trying to block change and don't understand our employers live in a, a very competitive era. It has to be a whole new discussion about partnerships and relationships and responsible competitiveness. You know, but what we've shown with janitorial workers or we've shown in healthcare, you can figure out ways for employers to succeed and the workers to do better at the same time. And I think that is the challenge we face in America, and then someone has to figure out whatever the third and fourth and fifth way is to do it. But it is about America becoming a team. And that is not how we think. And again, every time I say that, I know people think, oh, some big government, because we're in Washington, every time you say teamwork, everybody assumes we have to go down and pass a law you know, to get something done. But we are at a very, very wonderfully profound moment, where at the same time we can see all the trends are now in front of us, 
We see, as Rob talked about, what's happening to wages. We know some of the tools that are at our disposal. And the question is, do all of us love this country enough to do something about it? I do. I'm ready to make all kinds of changes, say all kinds of things like I just said that most people don't want union leaders to say. Are the Democrats? Are the Republicans? Are Americans ready to do it? And I'll end by saying this. We are watching how change is made in America through this immigration route. I started in America at a time when America was in turmoil. But it, a lot of things were happening. There was a civil rights movement. It had Stokely Carmichael saying, burn, baby, burn, and Martin Luther King saying, give peace a chance. And together, they actually made a lot of changes. Lyndon Johnson didn't wake up and pass a civil rights law because he realized he had made a big mistake his whole life. Uh, we had a young guy, this guy named Ralph Nader, who started a consumer movement in America, with these two women, Betty Friedan and uh, Gloria Steinem, who started a whole discussion about women in dinner tables. Every man in America was sort of confronted with women who were trying to ask themselves about their life and their future and their job. We had Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin in the countercultural movement. We had an anti-war. The winds of change were not here in Washington, D.C. They were blowing across the country, and they changed America, as did the labor movement. And now we're watching immigration, right? The winds of change are not here in Washington, D.C. In fact, when they were here in Washington, D.C., it was Sensenbrenner. That was the wind of change. But now we have a conversation going on in America, and I think it's incredibly healthy. People are fighting about immigration. Close the borders, throw them out. It's healthy. America needs a healthy conversation because our kids' future is at stake. And our future is not a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice, and it's time for America to make some. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. Um, as a, as a card-carrying economist, I have to say, markets working is just working differently. <laughs> and I think um, the reason, there are two reasons why it's working differently. One is we have to stop thinking of the market as being the United States. These dynamics, you know, what's happening in the rest of the world is bleeding into the United States, and what's happening in the United States is bleeding out into the rest of the world. And my guess is that if somebody had a year to construct a econometric model, you'd be able to figure out that the link between productivity and wages was there. It's just not here. Um, and the second is that we see these large distortions, things which are putting pressure on jobs and wages in a way that they never had before, in particular health care. What can the labor movement do to advance um, a approach to health care that over the long term um, contains the cost as well as providing coverage for everyone. And I, I agree with you incidentally about the unraveling of the employer provided system. Eight million people have, the, the number of people on Medicaid increased over the last four years by eight million people. Um, and when I read that I said how could that be? And the reason is the unraveling of employer-provided health care. Uh, they've been losing their health care coverage um, and had to move to Medicaid. Um, so what can I mean, you know, this, what kind this, of leadership can well, the union I mean, I take? think we have to say the way we're providing health care doesn't work. You know, we've held on to our health funds, our trust funds, our labor management funds. There have been you know, ways that we've added a value in terms of what do our members get and we provide the direct benefit. I just think it's over, so we need to say it's over and we need to uh, prod our business community because this is not going to be solved as a moral issue. If it was going to be solved as a moral issue, we would have solved it a long time ago because it's, in, it's immoral what is going on now in America if you're poor. You know, I marched across the Golden Gate Bridge with a woman from Iowa named Lisa Scott, worked every day of her life, a single mom, you know, got... 37 years old, you know, did everything America asked her to do. And I walked across the Golden Great Bridge because her 18-year-old daughter died because she couldn't afford $400 to get a chest x-ray that would have told her, you know, a very simple thing that was done because until she paid the bill, they wouldn't give her the x-ray because it wasn't, quote, an emergency and her daughter died, who was 17 years old. You know, and you think, this is in the richest country on earth. What are we doing here? You know, I was at Martin Luther King's birthday. I'm sorry for getting moral about this, but, you know, with a guy named Jairo Grasses, we were in this church, and Jairo was a speaker. He works at a condominium, got fired, God forbid, because he wanted a union. And, you know, he starts crying sitting next to me. I said, Jairo, I hardly knew him. I put my arm around him. You know, what's the matter? He said, 
Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm, I, had a, you know, I had a tragedy in my family. I said, what happened? He said, well, my, my sister worked in a nursing home her whole life, worked for Columbia, and she got sick, we think, because the chemicals they were using really weren't safe, and she got some kind of respiratory infection. She had an operation. Uh, you know, she has $5,000 worth of bills, and she's feeling really bad again, and she uh, went back to the hospital, and they said, you have to pay the bill off because it's not, it's not emergency surgery. So we collected all this money and we sent her back to Columbia, you know, because they have a healthcare system that actually would pay for her operation. And she died the day she got back there because she was poor. She died because she was poor in America. And then there was a New York Times article a couple of years ago, I'll never forget about Sheila Wiedenbaum, who's a, a, a mother with two kids, uh, lives in Connecticut. Her, her husband made a lot of money for a while, lost his job. Uh, she, she wasn't working, she has breast cancer, and she was at, they showed her begging on the street to raise the money to pay for her chemotherapy. It's like, what, what, if this is a moral issue, this is a, becoming a moral nation to allow you know, people who are poor or don't have health care to be in pain and sick and die. So I don't think we're going to solve this as a moral issue, but we should talk about it because it is a moral. You know, we're going to solve this because it's an economic issue. And the only way you have economic issues in America is not, in all due respect to all the uh, congressmen and senators, people don't look to them as the economic leaders of our country. Uh, in fact, the way they've handled the deficit, they have good reason not to be looked at as the economic leaders of our country, at least one party. Um, and, you know, they want to know where the business community. If this is a business argument, people will listen. If the business community comes out and says this healthcare system is dead, let's talk about what we're going to do to replace it. We can't compete in a global economy. We're losing good jobs in America. People will change, will have a greater tendency to change this healthcare system. There'll still be a huge battle about it. So to me, we need to give up what, quote, we have as the privileged, because the union members are the privileged healthcare people in America. We have to understand that our system is about to crumble. We'll just be the last one destroyed because we have some ways to negotiate with our employers and we need to move on and prod our business community to join with politicians and union leaders and the church and everyone else to find a healthcare system that that works in America that is an American system and and the only way to control cost is to change the system because you can't control cost with small pools you can't control cost with not bargaining with providers and right now we have a system that guarantees that you know Pharmaceutical companies, for instance, you know, have no one to bargain with them because we've made sure no one can bargain with them. We don't like the market sometimes. One of the, uh, I'm going to pose one more question and then, and then we're going to open it to everybody else. Um, one of the developments that's come along with globalization is as the market has increased in size enormously, um, so have the size of very large corporations. We now have the mega corporation in a way that we've never had before. Um, there's 74 uh, corporations in the world with revenues of $50 billion a year or more. Uh, there are only 53 countries uh, in the world with revenues, that is income, of $50 billion or more. The 10 largest U.S. corporations their combined revenues are greater than the GDP of all but seven countries in the world. Ten companies. Um, so we now have this mega corporation. How does a, what, is, what does a labor union do uh, when dealing with a mega corporation? Build global unions. Um, you know, I mean, I think you know, your, your facts, you know, just reinforce my feeling. It's always good to have facts that reinforce your feelings. You know, that we have companies, not countries, making the rule. We have these huge economic vehicles traveling around the world, as you said, in a global, the global opportunities, making choices, and countries can't regulate their behavior anymore. And that's a problem. Um, and two is, it means that government has to get over it. Because they can't, they think they're in charge, and they're not. So to me, for unions, it means you have to build global unions. And I keep saying the only good thing about mega global corporations is if you thought about how many small businesses Walmart has put out of business and how long it would have taken us to organize every one of those 150 to 300,000 little small retailers or drugstores or pharmacies or groceries, we could have never done it. We can organize Walmart someday. You see it, you know where it is, it has one name. And so in some ways, as hard as the fights are, the aggregation 
you know, has an advantage. But, we, but unless we understand that you know, companies have gone global and finance has gone global and trade's gone global, unions can't be national, but international, we're going to miss the boat. And right now, we, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but we have staff of SEIU that works in Australia, Warsaw, Hamburg, London, Geneva, Paris, and South America, and we're doing these global campaigns for cleaners and security officers around the world because they actually work for these some of these same inside some of these same companies doing cleaning and security. Uh, interestingly enough, the immigrate they're almost all immigrants in every country, you know, which is kind of interesting to go to London and find the same Mexican, Central American workers or African workers that you find in Minneapolis or other places because migration doesn't necessarily always come to the U.S. as much as we think we're the only people that's dealing with the immigration you know, issue. Everyone's dealing with the immigration, immigration patterns in the world because we are becoming a global world. So I think unions have to go global. And I think the future of the economic part of the future, I don't want to get too dramatic here, part of the future of the economic reality for the world will be whether or not unions, NGOs, the social responsibility movements can all unite around a series of uh, principles like the Sullivan principles were for South Africa, the McBride principles were for Ireland because the governments can't regulate. And you could actually imagine those kinds of organizations uniting with some governments. You know, now the, the likely suspects right now are the South American governments. You know, but you could have the Scandinavian and other governments say, you know, we really need a different world here and we need a code of principles because these, whatever you said, 54 corporations or these 10 corporations, we need to have them behave responsibly wherever they are because they affect the world now and they're the only, we need to use our power not in our nation state but in our global state to regulate behavior, or we have to create a global government, which I don't think is ever going to happen and it's a little bit utopian. So I think forces of the world are going to have to get together to regulate the behavior because no one else is, is around to do it. Let me say, just as a last comment, that the real challenge here is to recognize the challenges and problems that arise out of global dynamics while preserving the incredible benefits of globalization. Um, all that intensity of competition drives down prices. Um, it drives down the price of everything that everyone is wearing today, of every computer that we use today. It creates the technology. Um, the Industrial Revolution had terrible initial problems and created broad-based middle classes. Globalization is creating, is going to create um, enormous middle classes in countries that were the poorest countries, among the poorest countries in the world 10 or 15 years ago. This is an enormous advance for mankind. Um, we stand at a very particular position in the global system um, where we are getting certain effects that other countries are not and certain benefits. We have enormous advantages in the global system. Um, we need to preserve them and figure out um, a way to make it work for everybody. Um, questions? Um, Tom, Tom Etzel. All right, to Andy, a couple of questions. One, you talk about Team America, and then you, you talk about Team America, and then you talk about the idea of global unions where you're going to have unions of very different pay scale, I mean, members of the unions of different pay scales within the same union, effectively competing with each other. The second question is that you've been very successful, but your target universe have been people who are very hard to outsource. Uh, the outsourcing industry has been extraordinarily inventive with this latest thing I've read about uh, McDonald's using people in India to take orders from people driving at drive-ins. How, in terms of all workers, does this union movement of idea of yours work? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's obviously more complicated than I understand, so you sort of just have to start doing it and see what happens. You know, on the second <coughs> question, I'd say, if we can't construct for the jobs that are going to stay in this country, which there will always be some, I hope, if not, we're not going to have much of a country, uh, you know, if we're just having rich people 
you know, exploit people around the world so that, you know, some number of people can be wealthy. I assume that's not anybody's vision of America. So there's 50 million jobs now in the service sector. Some number will be destroyed and some number will be created, but in trucking and entertainment and healthcare and growing food and processing food and, you know, working at the ports, things that jobs that are going to, you know, large chunk will stay and another chunk will be created for other reasons. Um, you know, we, if we can't solve that problem, we're never going to get to your problem. So I keep saying, well, first of all, can we solve the problem for the 50 million? Let's not make this overly complicated. To build an American economy that works, you've got to start with the 50 million jobs that are here and make sure they pay decent wages and benefits because they're not competing worldwide. And then you have a huge problem after that because of what Rob said, which is we're not stopping trade. In case anybody's missed it, we're not stopping it. You know, this is somewhat reminds me, I said, of, you know, is there going to be a Palestinian state or is Israel going to exist? It's kind of like there is going to be a Palestinian state. Israel's going to exist. Now we're just negotiating the terms, right? Well, we're negotiating the terms of trade, not is there going to be trade of how much and what way and what, you know, is it fair, isn't it fair? But we're just on the terms, not the, the question of trade anymore. And so I think it's, I think we live in an incredibly dynamic economy where we are not, we are all so employer based because we've been so anti government anything that we don't have the tools right now to allow the portability, mobility, job creation, job destruction. And we're going to have, unions are going to have the same conflict that I think America's having right now. Rob is right. Probably on a global basis, you know, there are always going to be winners and losers as the economy shifts. You know, China has a growing, you know, a large number of people gaining wealth, although McKinsey is about to release a sport report that says China has the greatest disparity of wealth in the world right now. So it's not as if it's the market is working any differently than it's working here. It's just there's a lot of people to bring up when you got 1.4 billion. And if 100 million get up pretty high, things look good, even though there's still 1.3 that aren't doing so well. So I think we have a problem in America, and I'll answer the last part of your question, which is who, if our leaders of our business community, which had a lot to do with the success of America, you know, there was a lot of entrepreneurial spirit, there were a lot of smart people, become global business leaders, just like economists become global economists, who's taking care of America? Where's the American leadership coming? If Jeff Imholt gets every day at GA and says, how's the American market doing today, not how is my American company? And he is going to get there. I'm not saying personally. It's just the trend. People are becoming, and who knows how long the GE president will be for the United States. You know, Anne Mulcahy from Xerox thinks her next president of Xerox Fujitsu is going to be the Japanese. You know, so what does that mean for an American, quote, an American company? And where, so where's the American leadership? And the union movement is going to have the same conflicts. The more you become a global union, the more you face the question, are you raising the wages in China or raising the wages in the U.S.? I just think... Those are facts of life. But I think America, I'm not saying the globalists in America, but someone in America better stand up for America. You know, I'm not trying to say America only closed the border. I'm just saying someone better make an American plan for America because the global plan doesn't necessarily benefit America naturally. And there are things we could do in America, mm -hmm. like health care and pensions, to make this transition a little bit better for everyone, but someone better stand up for it. And, and I'm, the missing business leadership in this country at this moment of history is pretty startling. It is interesting that pay for economic modernization and about 20% of Chinese today have health care coverage. Um, and if you get sick in China and you go to the hospital and you can't pay, you don't get in. You don't get treated. Uh, that's a very brutal system. Um. Both of you a couple of different things you said that, um, Rod, you said that with the, that the obvious results of the greater international competition and globalization is a cut in wages, a cut in jobs, a cut in benefits. Now, it doesn't appear that the result has been a cut in executive compensation, and I'm not sure whether mm. it's resulted in a cut in profits. So obviously mm. there are some areas of wealth formation that aren't on the cutting table for reacting to your description of globalization. And sort of go to Andy's um, uh, references to where the intervention is, and so I think you've sort of posed, are there going to be 
intervening people or intervening laws or intervening sort of winds of change. Mm -hmm. I, I think right. what you've said is mm -hmm. we're not sure who's going to intervene and what's going to intervene and what pace it's going to intervene. Are those areas that need intervention or will be intervened in? Well, there's... Again, profits and, and compensation since this they is, are now on the right. table with energy in particular. This is certainly... Um, this is actually markets at work. Um, uh, average wages are down in real terms. Wages in the top 20% are up quite strongly. They're up because they are global, globally competitive. Um, it's specialized knowledge that's in greater demand. Um, there's more capital. You work with more capital, more databases and computers, et cetera. So what you're producing is more productive. Um, that, that is the market at work in the United States. That's our advantage. Uh, that's what we do better than other advanced countries, um, is organize highly sophisticated knowledge in networks and relationships that span the globe. And the people who participate in that get paid very well. Um, even in kind of more basic terms, the supply of labor in the global supply of labor has effectively doubled in the last 15 years. Supply of capital has not. When the supply goes up, the return on it goes down. So that the return on capital is up and the return on labor is down. There are record profits in the United States. Uh, U.S. corporations have made higher profits than at any time on record. Moreover, the share of national income generated by capital has moved up a couple percentage points and the share generated by labor has moved down. Those are relationships that don't change over a couple percentage points normally over any short period. They're very, very stable relationships economically. So the economy is increasing the returns on capital and, re and reducing the returns on labor. Um, well, one thing we can do you know, there's, a, there's legislation in Congress right now to reduce the um, uh, tax burden for another year of banking and security institutions that have just recorded the largest profits in their history. American corporations pay a smaller percentage of GDP and um, smaller share of total revenues of any time in 50 years. This is a legislative decision. Um, look, there are lots of problems, a lot of people from business here, there are a lot of problems with the corporate code. I think most business would be happy if we could simplify it and increase the revenues. Um, I think most would be satisfied with that. Um, the problem is the intervention of a congressional system that doles out special breaks and um, is too responsive to, to certain interests. So, in nice words, I'd say, there is a difference between the market and greed. You know, if you invested in the CEOs who were the highest paid every single year since 1990, you would have lost money. So, you know, all this talk about merit pay for everybody, you know, it doesn't seem to work at the top. I mean, it's just greed. I mean, people are greedy. And, and we've lost, you know, a sense of propriety. And for all those people who worked on Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign, he had that little sign up, it's the, or Carville did, it's the economy stupid. Well, for Democrats, it's distribution, stupid. We should stop talking about growth and more jobs and average wages, you know, as someone wrote a column about, you know, <coughs> four workers sitting around, you know, one of them leaves and Bill Gates comes in and the average wage just went up $20 million, you know, but no one, every other, every worker's still making the same amount of money. Averages don't matter because there's highs and lows and, you know, they don't matter. There is a... There is, a, there is a loss of propriety. We've unhinged things somewhat because the market's not working, somewhat because the government's not working, and somewhat because people are greedy. Um, and we don't like to say that. If we want to have merit pay, let's have merit pay. But if we don't want to have merit pay. So it is, you know, there is a distribution problem in America. And the economists have told me when I was growing up, markets were going to solve the distribution problem. Then I was told education would solve the distribution problem with, except, the market. with the market, but except we only need 1% more college graduates by 2015 in this economy, right? So maybe everybody's going to, the other 
eight, 75% of Americans don't have college degrees that could compete for that 1% of the jobs, but it seems like that's not going to solve the problem. I, I, Bill Clinton had a totally logical idea that high-tech jobs you know, would solve the problems of our, that's where I thought my kid was going, to Silicon Valley or somewhere else. I was kind of happy. That seemed like a nice, interesting, fun job to do, except you know, then Tom Friedman told me about you know, the world going flat and broadband and now all those jobs that we thought were the answer, as you talked about, those mid-level jobs. So they're all gone, so we don't have the market. And we can put the market, the education, high-tech jobs, and then we, can, then we can not tell the truth. I'm not saying you are. Like saying average wages are up. There are more jobs in America. You know, uh, well, that doesn't help the person who has 121% of debt you know, in their lifetime. It doesn't help the 50% of people who have no savings you know, really in America. That's not helping the average. I, uh I can't resist not saying this to the um, chief of staff, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Clinton, and that is, you know, CEO pay is an interesting problem um, because I don't think anyone wants the government setting the compensation levels of CEOs. Um, government has utterly no competence to do that. Um, but you know, there's a fairly simple, I think, simple response that we could have. You know, CEO compensation and executive compensation are set by compensation committees of the boards of directors who are largely appointed by the CEO. Uh, and that's how you get $400 million severance packages. Uh, let's just leave it to the owners. Um, let's say that, um, this has been one of my pet ideas for a long time, uh, let's say that um, any compensation that exceeds $1 million, $2 million, whatever, has to be approved by the shareholders. Goes on, it's an annual vote. They own the company. Let them decide what the proper compensation is. Um, and that is a, that's a market solution. Um, and the problem with CEO compensation is that the compensation has been taken out of regular market dynamics. Um, and let the, you know, California State Teachers Pension Fund um, and the insurance companies and the mutual funds decide whether it makes sense to compensate a CEO at the level that the Compensation Committee thinks they should. Um, I think you would see a, uh, the beginning of renewed discipline in CEO compensation. I think you would see an immediate response from corporations um, that don't want fights um, as well they shouldn't. And why shouldn't the owners determine the compensation? So. Yes, Matt. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Andy. I'm Jake Colvin. I'm with the National Foreign Trade Council, the Trade Association here in D.C. Um, Andy, at the beginning of your talk, you, you said uh, that the Democratic Party doesn't do a good job having a discussion on trade and, and economics, and I would agree with you. I wonder what your contribution to the discussion on international trade would be, and sp specifically, um, how would you consider we proceed on uh, further liberalization going forward, globally, bilaterally? What should any administration, any future administration be doing? Well, well first of all, you know, as I said, I think we start with the premise that we are trading. You know, the, the cat's out of the bag. Ch once China was let into the WTO, we're now just negotiating within some context the rules of the game, you know. But what's really happened in America, I think, is that trade has become the stalking horse for the inequality in America. Because I'll tell you, if I had a wife and two kids in Ohio, and someone told me they were going to close my plant, and I was going to find a job that made eight to ten thousand dollars less and had no health care, I'd fight like hell for my family. And I think people are fighting for their families right now. It's not like people are inherently against trade. They're just her inherently appropriately against the results they've seen of trade of exactly what Rob talks about, the unhinging. They see the salaries of CEOs going up. They know they work harder than, harder than any industrialized nation in the world. Americans now work. We've done a great job. If Americans should get rewarded on productivity, we should be proud of ourselves because we've done a really good job between technology, hard work of making Americans as productive as anyone in the world. They just feel like it's unfair and they're going to fight and should fight you know, for their families and their kids. People do 
things that are rational in their world because they're people. Not, it's not a policy. It's not macro, it's micro. And until we solve the fact that we don't have health care in this country, in most jobs after you lose them in Ohio and Michigan and find your, if we don't realize that people are making, according to the, the economist, eight to $10,000 left in the jobs being created versus the jobs that are leaving, people are going to fight like hell and they should you know, for their families. And Amer if America can't solve that problem for them, and if we are really, here's what bothers me, not that we're exporting, you know, jobs to third world countries, that's bad enough, right, at third world wages. We're importing third world wages into America. That's what the University of Miami is about. That's what the truck driver's making, eight bucks, ten bucks an hour. We're importing third world wages into America as opposed to creating decent jobs here where we can for the jobs that aren't trade sensitive and people are fighting and so I say to everybody you want to you want to solve the trade problem find that make those 50 million jobs in the country better do something about our health care system and pension people stop fighting about trade I, I didn't have anything substance to say but I thought that was just a great answer thank you very much uh, we have time just for one hmm. more question actually wait in the back Thanks, uh, Andy, for, <clears throat> for that um, tremendous uh, panorama of what we're facing. Um, I think, as Rob was saying, clearly there is a need for a new political economics, uh, and there isn't. I mean, we still have our father's theories, which clearly are not, uh, not working now. I mean, there's no one, I don't, I don't think, who can argue with that. But my question was more on the politics. A um, couple of data points. One is, Back in the 04 election, lots of manufacturing unemployment, very depressed conditions in critical battlefield states, yet the, uh, many people have suggested that voters are, voted against their economic interests in, uh, because of some other larger de desire. You mentioned that this is a moral issue. I wonder if you could speak about how one connects up morality to these economics and maybe makes that case that way. The other is on political contributions. Someone mentioned that many of these multinational companies are operating on a completely global basis, whether they're CEOs, American, or let's say if they're American citizens, whether they, when they go home at night, worry about these things we don't know, but they probably feel they have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize earnings per share globally, and that is what they're doing. Whether that's good or not for America probably is a secondary thing, yet they're able to make the political contributions that help to determine policy and elections. If you could speak a little bit about some of those points, the politics of this, uh, what lessons can we learn and how do we move forward? I mean, I, the politics are complicated. P you know, people are making investments in politics and they expect a return on, I mean, on their investment. There's not ideology involved in corporations. They're looking for a return on their investment. So they're going to make as much investment as they think is good policy. I'm just talking macro. There's lots of individuals that have... So I'm just saying, let's just publicly finance these elections and get out over with. I appreciate there's always going to be independent expenditures. One of these days, Buckley v. Vallejo will get overturned because it was written at a different time under different circumstances. But unless we want people investing in politics like they invest in capital and they invest in training, you know, we're just going to have a distorted political system. I'm, I'm totally involved in distorting the political system, you know, with contributions. You know, that's, that's what we've become in America, so we have to do that. Second thing I just always want to say, because there's always some Democrats in the room, uh, you know, Thomas Frank wrote this book, and here's my translation of the book. Translation of the book is that Democrats in, are seen by people in Kansas as Volvo driving, latte drinking, Sardinay sipping, Northeast, Harvard and Yale educated liberals. And I keep saying everywhere I go, Frank says that's how they're perceived. I say that's the reality. That is who people see as leading the Democratic Party. There's no authenticity. They don't look like them. People are not voting against their interests. They're looking for someone to represent their interest who's authentic and true and has done something besides give a speech or say, you know, I used to work in a union hall when I was 18, you know, before I became an investment banker. And when John Kerry, this is like, this is my, as Matt Bynes knows, my like boiling point had his moment at the Democratic Convention to introduce himself to the world and had to decide who he was going to put in the box next to Teresa. You know, the Republicans and Clinton always got it, was a school teacher, a firefighter, and to put Bob Rubin in the box next to Teresa Hines when you're introducing the world and then blame Kansans? 
is crazy. If people don't get that they don't stand, the Democratic Party does not stand for people's economic interests, they don't fight for it. I'm not saying in their heart they don't believe it, but you couldn't find an, enough Americans who could give you 10 things Democrats stand for in terms of economics. There's no authenticity, as Joe Klein would say. There's, it's just bogus to blame the workers for the lack of leadership in the Democratic Party. Well, on that note, the <laughs> New Democrat <laughs> Network thanks all of you for coming in. I really want to thank Andy thanks, Stern, Ralph. who was great. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, Bill Clinton had a totally logical idea that high-tech jobs, you know, would solve the problems of our, that's where I thought my kid was going, to Silicon Valley or somewhere else. I was kind of happy. That seemed like a nice, interesting,